Children, if you would come up, please, for the children's moment. Good morning, Carolyn. Let's just have a seat right down here for first, at first, please. Chesney, is Nolan okay today? Oh, he's with my wife? Okay. I bet they're having a good time. Just want to make sure he's, I want him to see Harold today. Did he see Harold? Okay. All right. Carolyn, good morning. Carolyn's missing a tooth. She's got to be a first grader. Yeah, yeah. Jesney, how are you doing? Good. And who's your friend here? Reynolds. Reynolds? Oh, what a pretty name, Reynolds. Nice to meet you. I'm Justin. Nice to meet you. And this is Joshua. Joshua, meet Reynolds. He, he's in my class. Oh, he, you know each other. Okay. That's well, all right. Don't, don't roll your eyes like that. It's okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Okay, you guys, we're doing something special today. And Jane Bear is going to lead us in. We're going to pray for these Christmas boxes that are going overseas to bless children like you, children who don't have money, children who are hungry, children who often don't have electricity. Sometimes they don't even have clean water to drink. So these are going to go overseas to lots of different children. And lots of them don't have toys. That's right. Do you see the one you put together? Yeah. Which one is it, Joshua? Yeah, oh, this one here? Okay. All right, good. All right, Jane, I'm going to let you take over. I'm going to sit with you guys. Is that all right? I, I just would like um, any of you ladies or kids or gentlemen who, who made one of these boxes, would you please come forward and stand around them? Joshua, did you help make one? Anybody who helped put together a box? Okay. It's okay, you can stay there. There are 41 boxes. Yes. Yes, I think it's wonderful. We have 41 boxes, and they will go all over the world, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. So um, Nancy is going to offer a prayer, but let's precede that by each one of us just bowing our heads for a moment of silence and just think about your box and pray for the box that you made and where it might go. And then, Nancy, would you close this with Forty-one. Yeah, awesome. That's beautiful. Joshua, girls, right over here. You'll sit over here on this side of me. On the, over here. Over here. Everybody over here. Joshua, they can do it. You just sit over here too, buddy. You can sit, sit over. I big boy. Oh, you gonna sit over here by the big boy? Is this the big boy side? All right. No, that's, that's the girl side. This is the boy side. 
Okay, girl side, boy side. I'm glad you got that straightened out. Good job. Okay, James, I'm going to ask you to hop up and shut off the lights again. Now these boxes you've put together with love are going to go all over the world to help other people. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that beautiful? Help other people. Jesus says that we are the light of the world. Have you ever thought about that? He says that every believer that follows him is the light of the world. We give off light and love so people can see God, see God more clearly. Okay. Now, this is what the world looks like. It's, it's round. And because people don't want to believe in God or can't believe in God yet, it's a dark place. There's lots of bad things that happen in the world, but there's something wonderful going on. Is that when we believe in Jesus, when we give our hearts to Him, when we follow what He tells us to do, loving our neighbors, helping other people like the shoe boxes and other things, helping our schoolmates, helping someone up off the ground when they fall down on the playground, helping mom and dad, we become we become light. Now notice See how the light goes through these holes? Every Christian is an opening that light shoots through to other people. This is you. This is you. When you love somebody, you're light. When you care about somebody, when you serve someone, you are light. Yes. It's, well, it's cool to be a Christian. It's not only cool to be, it's not only cool the flashlight's doing this, but it's cool to be a believer. Because, yeah, because Jesus says something really kind of interesting, that when we give our life away, when we help other people, we get life. We find life. We find joy and purpose and destiny. So I want you to remember that. You are the light of the world. And though there's darkness in between us, between believers, wherever we are, we're to be a shining light. Okay? Can you remember that? To be a little light? You know that little song? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Come on. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I know that. Do you know that? Yeah, I, I, I learned it from preschool. Right now I'm in preschool. Okay, very I good. I know that one. Very good. So this is what I want us to remember. This is our lesson today. To be light. Okay? All right. Thank you, James. Who would you like to pray for today? Let's take hands and pray. Chesney? You want to pray for your baby sister that she gets out well? Okay. We're going to pray for that. Reynolds? You want to pray that you love your family? Well, I'll tell you, sometimes that's what we have to pray, don't we? Yeah, that's right. Very good, Reynolds. Joshua? Very good, Joshua. Joshua wants to pray for the boxes that they give joy and love. Right? Carolyn, anything you, anybody or anything you'd like to pray for today? Your grandpa. Okay. Well, listen, you guys just mentioning that, just by saying those words, you've already said a prayer to God. Grandpa. You've said a prayer to God. Boxes. You said a prayer about mommy. God help mommy and this baby sister come out okay. And Reynolds, what was your prayer? Oh, to love your family better. Yeah. Those are all great prayers. Yeah.
Yeah, all right. Let's take hands. All right. We're gonna sing, we're gonna sing together this little light of mine again, okay? This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Not, how does that one verse go? Not gonna let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Oh. Hide it under a bushel. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Very good, you guys. Let's give the children a round of applause because they are going to do something great for Jesus. These people are going to do something great for Jesus. Give me a high five. All right. Oh, are you all right, Reynolds? All right. Joshua, Joshua, you can go first today. You're welcome. You didn't want? I didn't pack, um, pack a bowl. Okay. That's okay. That's right. One, all for one and one for all. Oh. Oh. <laughs> hey. Hey, no one. No one. Look over there. No one goes yay. Harold's back. Right. Nolan. Nolan, why don't you get a piece of candy? Thanks for streaking in here and getting the candy. Thank you, Krista. They're all the same size, Nolan. All right. Thank you, Nolan. Ladies, your turn. Thank you for being very good listeners and being patient. Thank you, ladies. You don't need to read the text. It's in the sermon. Just, just the text is in the sermon, so you don't need to read it. Yeah. Let's take our hymn books once again and turn to Hymn number 12. Praise Him, praise Him. Praise Him, 
praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Very good. You guys are singing wonderfully today. It's great to hear Christians sing. That's the difference between uh, tourists and uh, pilgrims to the Holy Land. The pilgrims sing, the tourists just go see things. Because uh, Christian pilgrims are there out of gratitude and out of awe and respect for what God has done through the Christ and through human history. The scripture is inside of the this, this sermon here, just briefly, so uh, Jane's been released from reading the two little verses. If you want to turn over to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, you need to circle this, those two verses, because this is the thesis of the letter to the Romans, Paul's most uh, deep and uh, definitive theological treatise of the New Testament. The dynamic power of God. The Greek philosopher Epictetus called his lecture room the hospital for the sick soul. Epicurus called his body of teaching the medicine of salvation. Seneca, a Roman philosopher and a contemporary of Paul, declared what humanity was looking for was ad salutum, which means looking toward salvation. As people needed, as Seneca wrote, a hand down to lift us up. Seneca went as far as to say, people were seeking peace, not as Caesar's proclamation, but of God's. Now we come to the thesis of Paul's magnum opus, in the letter to the Romans. If you have not turned, please turn to chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Just prior to these two verses, Paul has unveiled his heart's desire as he has been longing and yearning and eager to journey to Rome to preach the gospel to the believers there. And now in verse 16 and 17, he explains why he is so motivated to get to Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now we have been slowly chewing on the letter of Romans, and we're going to chew slow today. We're going to look at just verse 16, part A. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Now, I want us to think about this just briefly. There is a lot of misconceptions about the understanding of God's power. Some people believe that 
God is all-powerful in the sense that God is pulling all the strings in our lives, all the strings in society. That is not the understanding of the power of God because that would do away with human free will and it would do away with love because God loves us so much that he gives us the capacity to choose for ourselves. For the gospel is the dynamic power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. As previously stated, Paul longs, he yearns, he is eager to journey to Rome to impart a spiritual gift and to set the believers in Rome in a life-giving direction. This context is wrapped up in the little word translated for. For I am not ashamed. So Paul is now explaining why he is eagerly longing to come to Rome. Because the gospel is the power of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Paul uses a tiny little word, two letters, ou, O-U in Greek, which indicates absolute negation and denies even the possibility that he would ever be ashamed of the gospel. I am not and will never be ashamed of the gospel is what that little Greek word means. This means that Paul has this continuous attitude in his heart he is willing to risk reputation. He's willing to risk status. He is willing to risk the fear of embarrassment and disgrace along with all the painful feelings which accompany disfigurement, disgrace, and humiliation. Paul does not live in a fearful world. Did you hear what I just said? Paul does not live in a world of fear. He does not give two cents about what someone else thinks of him. He doesn't give one iota about someone's opinion of him. He doesn't care. Because he has been so deeply grasped and overtaken by Christ, it doesn't matter. The Greek verb is actually intensified, describing of being afraid and feeling shame, resulting in the paralysis of a believer from doing or saying something because of fear of humiliation. Paul is not paralyzed. Paul is not impotent to freely share the good news of Jesus Christ. And just the opposite. Paul is empowered with a dynamic energy to share the good news of God's great forgiveness and love through Christ. Paul is endued with Holy Spirit courage to stand up and declare the power of God through its, though it's a message as a stumbling block to the Jews and understood as foolishness, foolishness to the Greeks. For the, word of for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, there is a divergence that I want us to be clear. Um, I have to say that I'm borrowing some material from a, 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 an article, a sermon I found online that was very helpful. There is a divergence between being shamed for the gospel and being ashamed of the gospel. Faithful believers, I want you to hear this, Faithful, sold-out believers in Jesus Christ will be shamed for the gospel. S 
sold out believers in Jesus Christ will be shamed for the gospel. Why? Because the tsunami of the American culture and society is so set against the good news of Jesus that if we are being truly faithful to the good news of Christ, the morals and ethics of Christianity, and standing up and not being afraid of speaking the truth that we know in Jesus, we will be shamed. But we do not have to be ashamed. Now one of the things I have to ask myself is, when was the last time I was shamed for the gospel? I think that's a good question to ask. Not that we go out looking to be shamed, that's not the point. The point though is that when the light meets the darkness, the darkness pushes back. And we are met by shamers. But there's very good reason why we do not have to be ashamed when that happens. When we're shamed, there's no reason to be ashamed. Comparing Paul and Jesus, we find a reason for not being ashamed when we are shamed for the good news. We all need to hear the Word of God from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. For the joy that was set before Jesus, He endured the cross. He endured an excruciating death that you and I cannot even begin to imagine. Having to push Himself up on the two nails through His wrists on the side of that cross for every breath, as he slowly suffocated in bodily fluid and as his heart broke, literally, he endured the humiliation of being convicted and executed like a revolutionary, a brigand, when he was completely innocent. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Hebrews 12, 2. The shaming behavior heaped upon our Lord Jesus was as demeaning as he was probably executed naked and as cruel as it can be. But instead of letting the shame eat him up or make him feel ashamed, or turn him into someone weak and ugly as its shamers, which is always the great temptation. Jesus fixed his heart on the joy set before him, and he endured. He endured the cross. The power of the gospel, the power of the good news, the power of the message that out of God's righteousness, out of God's character, out of God's sense of God's own purpose, out of God's loyalty to God's self and to the world, to the cosmos, God reveals His very character in suffering, vulnerable love. This good news reflects the righteousness of God. God is faithful to God's own self. God desires the world and the entire cosmos to be in relationship and be reconciled back to Him. God desires that we find this new and living way opened up by the way of Jesus through the cross, through the Lordship of Christ, and following, following. 
the temporary triumph of Jesus' death, and then the power of God raising Jesus out of the dead, rescuing sinners, and vindicating Jesus kept Paul from being ashamed. It kept Paul from being fearful. It kept Paul from being cowardly. Jesus endured short-term pain for long-term gain. That is a phrase we need to get into our hearts, that we endure short-term pain to ensure long-term gain. Paul follows the steps of Jesus. I am not, and I'm going to use the Greek present tense verb, I am not and never will be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. We remind ourselves that the gospel alone, the gospel alone, there is no other place, there is no other religion, there is no other kind of spirituality that offers forgiveness of sin and grace. That's what separates Christianity from all other religions is that little word, grace. We need to be reminded that the gospel alone, we need to remember our conversion experiences. And if you haven't had one, you ought to get one. We remember those times when we understood that we were now ushered from being people hiding in the dark, and now we are ushered to the throne of grace, which the book of Hebrews talks about. We are brought before the throne, not of judgment, but grace. The throne of grace, which is right now, and the throne of grace when God reaches his end goal, when all things are reconciled to him. Paul would say, and Jesus too, and if you don't think Jesus doesn't say we're going to suffer as devout, pious believers, you have not read the Gospel of Mark very carefully. In the Gospel of Mark, there's a little word, paradidomai. And that word means to be delivered up. John the Baptist is delivered up to the authorities and gets his head chopped off. Jesus tells his passion narratives, the Son of Man will be delivered up and will be crucified, but on the third day will rise. In the little apocalypse of the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 13, Jesus says, when you are delivered up, don't worry about what you need to say, for the Holy Spirit will give you the words. The Gospel of Mark is a warning. If you're going to follow this Jesus completely, fully sold out, you're going to face persecution and shame. And you better be prepared. You better be trusting in the Spirit for this. Jesus and Paul would both say, be, mis be misunderstood. Yes. As you share the gospel, as you share your story with people, be misunderstood. Absolutely be misunderstood. Be shamed. Yes, be shamed. Let them shame you. Let them say things, Bible thumper. Goody two-shoes. The things that people call Christians. Yes, be shamed. But do not be ashamed. Because the message of God's saving work in Christ is the final triumphant message to the world. Short-term pain, long-term gain. For the joy set before you. For the salvation that only the gospel can gain. Take up your cross and follow Jesus and despise and die to shame and being shamed by others. You know, thinking about Paul, I came across this text in Isaiah. 
And I'm going to read this to you, and it's, it's almost like Paul takes Isaiah 51 and makes this his thesis for Romans. The 51st chapter. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my instruction. Do not fear disgrace by men. Do not be shattered by their taunts. For the moth will devour them like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will last forever, and my salvation for all generations. Wake up! Wake up! Put the strength, put on the strength of the Lord's power. Maybe that's our word to us today. Maybe it's the word for Justin too. Wake up! Wake up! Put on the strength of the Lord's power. Not our power. Not our church's power. Not our intellectual power. Not our financial power. The power of God. The power of the message. The gospel. Now quickly I want to look at four dynamics for the dynamics of the dynamic power of the gospel. The dynamic power of the gospel brings about radical changes in people's hearts and minds. Friends, some of us have been Christians too long. We have forgotten. It's interesting that in 1st or 2nd Peter, I cannot quote you the exact book, but in the first chapter of one of those two letters, Peter writes out all these virtues, all these characteristics, and down at the very bottom he goes, and if we fail to remember the sins of our past, we will not be effectual in our growth. We forget. We forget that we are sinners, saved by the grace of God, a God that has changed our worldview and our perspective, a God who has forgiven us and given us His mercy. Sometimes we are Christians too long. I think we would do well if we would follow the spirituality of Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer in the 16th century, who said these words, I have to get saved every day. If we would wake up in the morning and say, Lord Jesus, this is your day. I'm a broken sinner. I need you today. Save me today and use me today. I think that's a good way to start out the day. Save me every day. I need saved. I need delivered. I need rescued. The dynamic power of the gospel brings about radical changes in people's hearts and in their minds. When hearing the story, the good news, and responding by turning their faces back to God, they see this loving, forgiving God found in the face of the Christ. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. A hardened young man who fought in the Chechnya war in Europe was entertaining an offering from the mafia to become a hired killer. This young Chechnyan attended an evangelistic gathering and he heard the gospel and he submitted his life to Christ. God's story rewrites our history. God's story, the gospel, rewrites our history. Amen. Isn't that correct? Because when we come into this relationship with the Christ, when we come to God as a broken down ragamuffin sinner, full of darkness and selfishness, and we encounter, and we do all those things out of that place, we distrust God, so we, we sin, that's distrusting God, and then we commit sins, which is a way of trying to fill that vacuum in our hearts for God. When we come to faith in Christ, when Christ gets a hold of us and we see how much we're loved, we see the cross, we, see, we understand that not only did Jesus die for us, in the sense of taking our place 
for all the wrong that we have done. He dies for us in the sense of all the wrong done to us. Did you catch that? All the inward brokenness, all the things that we have been abused by and the people we've been abused by and the ways we've been used, that cross is not only for us, it's also for us. <laughs> Are you catching me on this? Because this is, this is very important. So what happens is, as we open up our hearts to Christ and we look back in our story, into our history, now it's being rewritten. Because now we see with a deeper perception and a reality that these things were done to me. I did these things. I am responsible for some of this, but some of this is not my responsibility. And our history is being rewritten by the power of God because we now understand the fullness and the mercy and the forgiveness and the light that has shined into our darkness. And that is why anything that's happened to us before Christ is never wasted by God. Because God takes those things and empowers us to use them. That's part of the message of the cross. The places where we were killed, where we were crucified, where we were abused, where we were humiliated. The cross is the symbol that God takes those things and resurrects them to the blessing of the world. We comfort, we comfort others with the comfort that we receive from God. Hebrews, that's why I'm talking about God rewriting our history. When his story, when his story, his story gets into our story, our story is rewritten to the glory of God, to the benefit of the world, because we become light, we become speckles of light in the darkness. The second thing is that the gospel, the dynamic power of the gospel illuminates human consciousness and our conscience. A guilt-laden woman who had had a number of abortions attended a Christian festival with her husband. The evangelist gave an invitation to anyone who wanted to receive the gracious forgiveness and the beauty of Christ. She rose up, and as she did, her husband grabbed a hold of her to pull her back down in her seat. Her husband announced that if she went forward, he would abandon her. And she turned and said these words, To be free from sin and guilt is more important to me than anything in the world. Anything including you. And she received Christ that day. I ran across a woman about a year ago who was uh, immersed in a lesbian lifestyle. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not against gays and lesbians or any of the other categories out there. This, that's, this is not the point of this story I'm about to tell you. But this is what she told me. She goes, you know, I was in that lifestyle for, for quite a few years, and then I took up the Bible and I started reading it, and I came under conviction. That doesn't mean God was going like this. <clears throat> it means God was showing and teaching her that God had something better for her than that lifestyle, and she gave up that lifestyle. Nobody had to preach to her. Nobody had to arm twist her. Nobody had to make her feel guilty. The power of God did it. <laughs> God's power. It illuminated her conscience, and she walked out of the old and into the new. The third dynamic is that the power of the gospel creates a new world view. When the forgiveness and mercy of God found in Jesus is spiritually ingested into one's mind and perceptions, all things within one's mind begin the process of being transformed. Do not be conformed to the pattern, the mold of this world, 
but have your minds transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. People come to understand God. This is true. What I'm, what I'm about to describe to you is exactly what happened to me when Christ got a hold of me in August of 1981 on the motorcycle. People come to understand God differently. People come to understand themselves in a new way. They're called in a, they are called into all of creation in a qualitatively different mode. In a fresh way, when the gospel reaches hearts, the world changes. The best translation of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and every one of us ought to have this taped to our mirror. Because this is the best translation. When anyone is united in Christ, there is a new world. The old order has gone, the new order has actually begun. Those grasped by the unbelievable good news of Christ receive a new sense of one's identity. Paul understood this firsthand. Remember? In Acts chapter 9, he'd been persecuting the church. In Acts 9, he's going to Damascus on a road, and the light of Christ drops on him. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I'm the ones that you're chasing after to throw in prison. Paul becomes blind. He doesn't eat or drink for three days. He's a dead man. That's what dead people do. They don't see, they don't eat, they don't drink. But on the third day, God spoke to another believer, Ananias. And God said, go to Damascus on the road called Straight. Lay your hands upon Paul and tell him how much he has to suffer for me. Now listen to this. This is one of the most powerful things in the New Testament. Ananias goes to Damascus. He finds Paul in darkness, hungry, thirsting, like a dead man. And it says, Ananias laid his hands on Saul and said, here's the words, Brother Saul. In that moment, Saul of Tarsus understood that he was included in the new movement of God through Jesus. Brother Saul. He was a part of the family. He was connected to Ananias in a new and fresh way. The conversion of Saul was so powerful, and so was the conversion of many of the first and second century Christians, that they were given new names. Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul. And in, you can read Christian history, names were changed to say, I have a new status, I have a new understanding of who I am, I have a new identity rooted in the gospel, in the story of God. And it changed their very names. It changes one's understanding of our status before God. We're accepted. You see, one of the things we don't understand is that God has indeed passed judgment. And the verdict is salvation. I want you to catch this. We've just went through this whole Rittenhouse thing in, 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 in media. God passes judgment, and the verdict is salvation. And if you don't understand that, you've got a long ways to go, my friend. The verdict is salvation. 
wholeness, redemption, rescued, accepted. And the gospel power offers us a new sense of purpose, a new sense of serving, a new sense of glorifying God. It creates in us a new sense of destiny, a destiny that's yoked to Christ's destiny of new life, of power, of life eternal, of eternal life. What are we talking about? We're talking about the very power of God, because only God is eternal. Resurrection is what we're talking about. A worldview that brings resurrection. <coughs> the gospel and the power of the gospel, the dynamic power of the gospel, also alters social structures. The, the dynamic power of the good news changes entire societies. The power of the gospel ignited the bloodless revolution in the 1980s that ended with Russia collapsing and the Berlin Wall being smashed, and it was led by the church. Most people don't know this. It was led by the church. 1989 was the millennium a thousand years earlier, the gospel was introduced to Russia and Eastern Europe. God used that millennium, that marker of a thousand years of Christianity to create the spiritual hunger and power that led to the collapse of the former Soviet Union. It was the power of the gospel, primarily through Bishop Desmond Tutu, that helped end apartheid in South Africa. It was the power of the good news working through John Woolman, George White Whitfield, and others who banished slavery in America, Europe, and England. In the early second century, it was the Christians who had already, to be, already had begun to build hospitals for palliative care. In other words, the Christians and the Christians alone built homes or took homes and brought in the dying into their homes and cared for them so they would, they would die not isolated and alone. Even the Roman historians could not, could not write that off. They write about it. It was the Christians. It is the Christians today. Over 1,500 hospitals around the world how many schools have the Christians put together to build to help educate people? Oh yes, there are things that we can point at. Oh yeah, that was a bad chapter in Christianity. But friends, let me tell you, anybody who wants to come at you that way, you can just stop and say, I belong to the largest hospital network, school network, clinic network, higher education network than any network in the world, and it's Christianity. The gospel alters social structures. Let's go to the last slide, please. Now here's my question. It's a question to me, and it's a question to you. Do you believe Paul's thesis in Romans 1.16? Do you believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who will believe? Do you believe this? Do you really believe it? Then let's act like it. That's my point, and that's the point to me too. If we truly believe this, then let's act like it. Let's be sharing the story, telling our story on top of the gospel story so people can see how it's fleshed out, how God has worked in our lives so that people can be transformed, that so people can change, so people can have a better, more abundant life. Instead of us hiding our light. And I have to say this, it takes words. There is no one in this room who live such a wonderful life that the gospel just oozes out of them, and as they come through a room, everybody stands up and sings, How Great Thou Art. 
That just doesn't happen. Jesus Christ healed the sick, cleansed the lame, restored the leper, raised children from the dead, and he had to announce with words, the kingdom of God is at hand. We have to say those words. There's a different reality. There's a different sphere of influence, a different realm, a different world, a different way of living and being. It's called the kingdom of God. So I'm going to quote Isaiah and come back to us, come back to me. But my righteousness, this is God's righteousness, but my righteousness will last forever and my salvation for all generations. Wake up! Wake up! Put on the strength of the Lord's power. Put on the strength of the Lord's power. Will, we're going to spend some time in the quiet, listen for the Christ to speak to us. We're going to have a song played by Bob Calloway. Then we're going to go back in the quiet again for a while. It's just a way of us for centering and thinking deeply about the good news.